So maybe sarcopenia, and osteopenia. Um, and for those of you who don't know Steve, um, number one, he's been a very, very prolific scientist. And Steve was really instrumental in kind of consideration and creation of osteoporosis and osteopenia as an indication. And his attention and the research efforts have turned much more towards um, skeletal muscle and the interactions of muscle and bone. So, Steve. Thank you, Bill. And thanks for the opportunity to be here. Uh, and uh, so, I'm going to take on the story of osteoporosis as a way of trying to uh, tell an advanced story or warnings about the diagnosis of sarcopenia. So, uh, we start with the idea that we define a lot of conditions in medicine using measurements, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, osteoporosis, and sarcopenia. And using measurements to define conditions raises three issues in particular that are common to all of these fields. So as you struggle with the definition of sarcopenia, you'll have to have company and those of us who've been through that with osteoporosis and those who've been before for other conditions. So uh, I'm going to give you an outline, first of the basics of osteoporosis, and then tell you the story about the evolution of osteoporosis and osteopenia, the issues and lessons that it has raised, and then, then put those issues in the context of uh, making the definition of sarcopenia. So here are the basics. Everything you need to know about osteoporosis in about two minutes. First of all, bone mineral density is a very accurate measurement of bone, and its measurement is related to risk of fracture. The lower the bone density, as you see in the bottom of the T scores, the minus scores are positive. It's a continuous relationship. There are no obvious biological thresholds. In addition, bone density declines with age consistently. As does muscle mass. And the way this is described in the osteoporosis arena that I'll use is by T scores. T scores are the distance from a young normal being, about a 30 year old. So the minus one T score is about a 10% lower bone density than a 30. And here are the issues that I'm going to try to go through one by one, and that is by definition, cut points for, di for diagnosis. And in addition, when you choose to compare to young adults, it will generate a high prevalence of whatever diagnosis you make amongst the people. And in addition, ultimately, as you develop drugs for the treatment of the condition, the cut points that you use for diagnosis will inevitably differ, differ from the approach to treatment. And finally, treatments, their, their issues will, will arise because treatments may not work by means of the biomarkers that defines the diagnosis, making it hard to consider these surrogate markers for use in the following patients. <coughs> so let's talk about the first one. From the point of view of the history of osteoporosis, back in the early 1990s, bone densitometers became widely available, and the people who were making the patients had a problem. What was the work? We were getting numbers, but we didn't know. Endocrinologists like to use two standard deviations from from a mean value to define the whole. And so that was done initially. But then a World Health Organization committee met in Geneva in 1992, parallel to a lot of the meetings I hear about now about sarcopenia, where extensive epidemiology was reviewed in relationships between bone density and other endpoints. And it was considered the T score of minus 2.0 should be used as a diagnosis of osteoporosis in normal. But the prevalence of osteoporosis is going to be 50, 45 percent too high. And so someone said, let's make it minus 3 for the prevalence, 5 percent too low. So this is a too high, too low solution that Goldilocks knows how to solve by picking a point in between. At a minus 2.5, things were just right because the prevalence of 15 percent was fine. 
square root 3 minus 1, and minus 2.5. And why the minus 1? I've asked and asked and asked and asked, but no one can remember. But it has huge implications for its prevalence in the population. So now, when you compare uh, two young adults, to, as you reference the normal, you end up with a high prevalence um, amongst uh, the younger of whatever diagnosis you've got. So in this case, the young mean is about, about 30, means that with each passing decade, 50, 60, 70, 80, you can see in the dark shaded the proportion of that group, that bell shaped curve of people who have known densities, BMDT scores at the bottom. The black line is minus 2.5, the red line is minus 1.0. So you can see the increasing proportions that begin to fall in those categories. And so uh, the prevalence of osteoporosis rises to 50% by the time you're over 80, and osteopenia is about 50% of people at any given age, and so that means only 9% of women over 80 are normal. And only 20% of those in the previous decade. <coughs> Well, these definitions have consequences. Many women who have now been screened, over 50% get a diagnosis. You have osteopenia on a red, yellow, and green vision. And uh, we've studied this in more than half of patients who get that di a diagnosis of osteopenia versus report anxiety and limit their activity, and about 25% limit their activity in order to minimize the risk of falls and fractures. And it increases, of course, even osteopenia substantially the chance that we get dry. And my favorite is severe osteopenia, which many patients regard as worse than osteoporosis. <laughs> the cut points for diagnosis and treatment, however, now make more than necessarily different. It would be great if osteoporosis per se were a simple indication. It would be great if sarcopenia became a, great, a simple indication for treatment, but there are problems. First of all, when you use any measurement, <clears throat> A single measurement to define risk, there are many other risk factors that come into play. Mm -hmm. And so that a woman, for example, with one BMDT score, minus 2.0 at age 60, has a very different risk when she's older or has another risk factor when she's looking. And so when you use just one measurement in order to define treatment thresholds, you're actually treating people who have wildly different risks. So treatment based on bone density uh, criteria as guidelines had for <coughs> Last decade or two, decade or two, T scores less than minus two and a half or two. In addition, many received drugs for a, a T score of a minus one or more for osteopenia. That meant that millions of young women with low fracture risk, who are relatively young, all they got is a low T score. We said received drug therapy, which will be of little benefit for them, even if it works. Older women. High fracture risk because of age and other risk factors may not qualify for treatment because their bone density doesn't cross that threshold. So this creates a real problem that has led many to a growing consensus that treatment in the future should be based on absolute risk of fracture. Now you can read into this if you're thinking about it. Uh, muscle, that treatment should eventually be based on absolute risk of the disability or the endpoint, the clinical endpoint of uh, sarcopenia. And we define these now as treatment thresholds. That's a probability. The thre treatment threshold is a probability of like a 20% chance of having a fracture in the next 10 years. And if you're above that, treatment is worthwhile. And generally, those treatment thresholds are based on analyses of the cost effectiveness of the treatment. So that we know that above a 20% threshold of risk, the treatment is cost effective. And below that level of risk, it's not. So that's the process that the field of osteoporosis has gone through over the last 20, 25 years. It's still going through to try to reconcile measurements of bone density and diagnoses with decisions about treatment and removing further and further right away, I think, from bone density as the sole basis. Because as you see, new guidelines from the United States have begun to use absolute risk, 20 or 3% for major hip fractures, respectively as the treatment threshold for women with osteopenia. The United Kingdom has just instituted
sarcopenia, pre-sarcopenia, stage one, sarcopenia. They're all considered to be diagnosis, and it may create an epidemic of worry in people who are low risk of disability. That's my fear as people start uh, making various definitions. And in addition, risk-based guidelines uh, it took us a long time to get there, and they're hampered by the lack of risk data from large cohorts and trials in a standardized way. We don't have, you know, we don't have coordinated assessments of risk in large cohorts that have fractures and endpoint level on uh, disability. And our, I'm worried that surrogates won't be established because specimens and measurements are only going to be made in trials in small suburbs because it's cheaper in the short term, expensive in the long term when you start to have to continue to pay for large scale trials. Okay, issues, cut points for diagnoses of osteosarcopenia will necessarily be arbitrary. And comparing young adults muscle measurement uh, as the basis for the diagnosis will lead to a high prevalence of the diagnosis in the elderly. Okay, so I mean the reason the cut points will be arbitrary in the encircopenia field is that all muscle measurements either have no, no relationship at all to subsequent disability or they have the same continuous graded response with no apparent biological threshold. And in that situation, the definition will have to be defined by a consensus of a committee. And committees struggle and struggle and struggle over this, but ultimately, as you saw with osteopenia, there is no point in struggling to the death because there is no right answer. There just has to be final consensus when somebody stands up and says, this is it. And However, in doing so, committees need to carefully consider all the future consequences of the definitions that I was just describing for osteopenia. The fear, the worry, the excess use of drugs, or maybe the underutilization of drug therapy amongst those at high risk who don't make the measurement criteria. And since all muscle measurements decrease with aging, defining normal compared to young uh, values will increase the prevalence of sarcopenia. Here is a uh, a slide in skeletal muscle index uh, versus the young adult values from N pains 2. You can see class 2, sarcopenia, class 1 is minus 1 to 2 in normal. Clearly, because that index goes down with aging, the prevalence of sarcopenia, regardless of the class, goes up. So I said if you were to use this measurement after the age of 60, only a third of the population would remain normal. And then I think it's important in the field to anticipate the treatment guidelines will eventually, regardless of, it will eventually come down to absolute risk in some fashion or another. And ideally, then, a coordinated international project could collect standardized data about a set of risk factors and clinical endpoints in existing studies or in future studies, some kind of collaborative effort, so that at the end we'll be able to have an international score of risk of some endpoint that's preventable with, with treatment. Perhaps that end up Maybe that endpoint is ADL disability, maybe it's mobility disability, maybe it's falls. But there will be in 10 years, 20 years, a lot of regret if this isn't done uh, along the way. And perhaps it could all be entered, uh, developed into a model that uh, I'm taking the liberty to call Max instead of France for muscle. <laughs> okay, and then implications for clinical trials. Uh, make sure that all these risk factors are assessed in all randomized trials in order to allow you to understand what the treatment means for people at various levels of risk of the endpoint. The entry criteria eventually have <coughs> indications for treatment. So the indications for using a lendronate or zolendronate or denosumab typically in osteoporosis drugs reflect what was used as entry criteria for the studies. And so it's led some of us to come to the conclusion that Enrollment in trials should not be based on just bone density or a marker or a measurement, but should be based on absolute risk of the endpoint, regardless of the bone density. If that's where treatment's going to go, then that's where trials should start. Now, uh, in addition, trials that are done in this area, I think, need to anticipate that cost effectiveness will be used to set those treatment thresholds under which we may make clinical decisions about using drugs, and that means including in the trials a collection of data that are used for such purposes like quality of life, the EQ5D, and health costs. Okay, lastly, treatments may not work for 
And so the surrogate marker is likely to be a com uh, it's likely to be a combination measure. Uh, and in order to define a good surrogate, both for drug development and eventually for as endpoints for trials, I think it's important to collect the measurements of the specimens at baseline and in follow-up in all subjects in trials, in all subjects participating in trials. In order to do this, ideally it would be done across sponsors through something like a collaborative trials group that would <clears throat> help to make sure that we are getting the best uh, bang for our uh, buck in creating surrogate markers for trials. Okay, so the um, defining sarcopenia, I hope you will mention to me that the definition will mean that you've got similar, if you've got that diagnosis, you've got similar risk of the endpoint. Everybody just got it, got similar risk. And a condition that responds, it identifies people respond to treatment, that means it'll be a measure of risk, plus some measurement of that muscle that indicates its responsiveness. But any diagnosis, any definition that comes about in the next decade about sarcopenia will be imperfect, it will create problems, and it will have to change. So let me summarize that diagnoses based on measurements are necessarily arbitrary. Many areas of medicine and hospitals struggle with this. And if you decide to compare to the normals, that means a large proportion of elders will have a diagnosis. Treatments will eventually be based on risk, not diagnoses. And so prepare for that now by getting standardized assessments of risk factors in cohorts and including them in trials and perhaps making those the definition of entry into trials. And markers for diagnosis, like bone density, a simple measure of mass, may be poor surrogates in order to establish better. I think that it's important that sponsors of trials collaborate to store specimens and repeat new measurements in everyone participating in the trial. And with that, I'm going to stop and say thank you for letting me come here from San Francisco. We have um, a time for maybe one question. So, where is the microphone first? Mr. Kahn, you see, I understood you right. The uh, most important point is the choice of the endpoint. Is there a consensus that uh, onset of disability is the most appropriate endpoint? Uh, all those in favor of onset of disability, raise your hand. All those in favor of falls. I mean, I don't think, I, we, I'm not in this field, not that I know, uh, but I'm not an expert in the definitions for the endpoint of this field. In osteoporosis, it's even Fracture is a fracture is a fracture, but no. In fact, every trial that I know of has defined fractures as differently. Taking four, taking six, taking all, taking all minus four. It is a wild madhouse, and so therefore we can't really compare the trials one to another straight on. And so, you know, I think that if standardization of the approach to clinical trials is one thing that can be done now, anticipating the needs that the osteoporosis is going to Thanks, Steve, for completely 